Welcome to the Naturally Nourished Podcast that delivers cutting-edge food as medicine solutions for optimal health. Allie Miller is a nutrition expert sought up by the media and America's top medical institutes for her revolutionary functional medicine interventions. From disease treatment to prevention, every episode will empower you with ways to put yourself back in control of your health. Please note, the topics discussed are for educational purposes only. Now welcome, Integrative Dietitians Allie Miller and her co-host Becky Yu. Welcome to episode 225 of the Naturally Nourished Podcast. Today we are going to be talking all things breastfeeding and sharing some updates on this topic as it's been a little while. Yes, last episode on breastfeeding was number 55, way back there, a couple hundred back, in fact. And this is, of course, when Stella had been breastfeeding and was actually weaning. So I had a totally different perspective at that time as more of a reflective episode on breastfeeding. And now Becky is talking to us at four months postpartum, so more in the thick of it. And um, I think it'll be interesting to hear more from the early stages and beginning for new mamas and to-be mamas to understand how to take something that could be such a struggle into something that becomes so effortless (laughs) and seemingly natural uh, and obviously very natural process that supports baby. So we'll talk today about the impact of breastfeeding, how to support lactation, meeting calorie needs for mama, and all of the things. If you want to check out episode 55 on breastfeeding support, as well as the blog we'll have linked in the show notes called Breast Milk, Nature's Perfect Food. And that's where I kind of mused on the influence of human milk oligosaccharides and the cannabidiol and nutrients and all of the good stuff. Yes, so hopefully I remember... (laughs) A good amount. I've got four months under my belt now and going strong. Um, So hopefully I'll just offer a little bit of fresh perspective on initiating the breastfeeding relationship, troubleshooting kind of some common issues that come up. Um, But let's just first set the stage since it's been a while and talk a bit about benefits of breastfeeding and why we call this nature's perfect food. Yes. So, you know, breast milk really is nature's perfect food. And anytime man tries to outsmart nature, we usually get nipped in the bud. And there are so many biological compounds that we'll talk about today that breast milk provides even beyond the perfect nutrition of macro and micronutrient needs. So we see that there are actual bioactive molecules that can protect baby against infection and reduce inflammation excess in the body that can contribute to the maturation of the immune process, reducing food sensitivities, food allergies, and illness. We can see support for organ development and then, of course, the microbial colonization, that initial thumbprint, if you will, on baby's microbiome. And that comes from a couple different compounds, both the idea that the breast milk itself has probacteria in it, and then there are also human milk oligosaccharides or particular types of carbohydrate chains that work as prebiotics to really aid in fertilization of the microbiome, maintaining viability and robust diversity. So really important influence and some of the kind of names of the immunoglobulin elements we see impact acting directly on secretory IgA. We see actual getting active immunoglobulins that would be destroyed, you know, by heat. Like when we talk about, for instance, our non-denatured grass-fed whey, we're getting some of those immunoglobulins even in that product. We get all that active in the breast milk as well. And we even see, again, some inflammatory modulating agents, both in our omega-3s. So if mom is supplementing, especially with like our EPA, DHA extra, they're going to pass omega-3 fatty acids through the milk. And then they're also going to be providing more novel therapeutic agents, which can regulate the inflammatory process. And we'll dive a little bit deeper into some of those nutritional focus um, elements, but let's also talk just kind of benefits overarching for mamas. Yeah, I mean, I think the number one is resetting your hormones, you know, so that immediate sucking after delivery 
aids in passing off the placenta and aids in driving the contractions of the uterus to help with that hormone reset process, which is extremely important and I think really plays a role with uterine tone. Um, so that prolactin is right away stimulated by sucking and that's going to also help with hormone regulation. We see progesterone levels decline pretty dynamically following the birth process and that reset of the progesterone estrogen balance and sex hormones. We see oxytocin, which is super huge as far as connection and bond and gets you through those sleepless nights and serves as an antidepressant, a huge mood boosting and stabilizing component. But also plays direct connection then with the milk production you know so the oxytocin actually causes the tiny muscles around the um uh, nipple to aid in milk duct function and so we see that connection both in the tone of the uterus as well as milk production through the immediate and that's the importance of that immediate you know chest to chest skin to skin impact that oxytocin surge beyond even the, the suckling influence and then there's the metabolic impact. So 500 to 800, I've even heard up to 1,000 calories extra burn. So you're basically running like five miles um, just from breastfeeding alone. So, you know, the influence of helping to lose the baby weight, but also seeing it being very important to be meeting your nutritional needs during this time. Yeah, absolutely. And I know we talked in episode 55 and also in the postpartum episode, I'm not sure the number on that, but we'll link that in the notes on, you know, what are those handy, you know, quick grab mm -hmm. snacks and calorie density options. And actually along that vein, I think we should share, I know you shared that you had tried the, per, or were doing more of the perfect mm -hmm. bars during your early postpartum when you talked about the delivery story. I think we should share what we've been really enjoying because oh, they sent yeah. us some snacks. Yeah. Um, they are listeners of the podcast over at Perfect Foods. Hey guys. Um, and they sent us some snacks and their most recent like chocolate dipped peanut butter cups, I yes. guess. Is that what they're calling them? They're, they're, they're delicious. <laughs> absolutely phenomenal. Um, so they have a really nice dark chocolate coating, really clean ingredient and flavor profile. And um, you even get like a superfood blend in each in that peanut butter protein um, area inside of the cup. Uh, I'll share a little bit more details in a moment. I'll pull them up. But that was definitely something that I'm like, mm, if I was breastfeeding, that's uh -huh. something I could get in. Because <laughs> I remember in the beginning days, um, those surges of letdown would have quite a blood sugar impact on me where I would go into like tunnel vision, mm -hmm. almost nauseated and, and felt like I was spinning. Um, and so that kind of like vertigo hit, that's where really that frequency of fluid intake and ample calories, um, yep. as well as of course, protein and fat. We'll get there though. Yeah, definitely in the, the early days, I had a few moments of like getting up to go to the bathroom right after feeding him. I'm like, whoa, I have not eaten enough today. And, you know, keeping your breastfeeding snack bin <laughs> by your bed in those early days, I think is, is really, really important. Um, and then on that element of the um, oxytocin connection and, you know, baby's kind of initial suckling, helping to literally contract the uterus, I remember that very, very vividly, you know, from the time that he was actually born and put chest to chest and even like the first week or so really feeling like that cramping, contracting sensation. Uh, it was quite uncomfortable, obviously very necessary for the uterus to kind of clamp down and, and go back to its normal size, but it's very dynamic initially. You really feel it. Yeah, and it's interesting because me having a C-section, you know, they actually do with that, that type of delivery kind of suck everything out, mm -hmm. yet there still is a lot to pass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, I could definitely notice that, that dynamic impact as well. Okay, so maybe let's get into a little bit on colostrum. So this is the first produced milk and kind of that initial milk. Um, so, so important and nourishing. And then we'll talk maybe about how it changes and um, composition and distribution. So I remember the colostrum um, I had been, I shared in my um, birth story episode, I had actually been using my breast pump 
um, to kind of induce labor. So uh, in that, you know, day and a half or so that I was in early labor, I was using it and actually seeing like, oh, this is cool. My body's actually making colostrum. So it's this like yellowish um, substance. And maybe mine was extra yellow because of turmeric or something like that. Um, no, but, it's pretty yellow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty yellow. Um, and this is kind of that initial, you know, you really only need like a couple of drops um, per feeding that the baby's getting. Yes, so it's going to be richer in fat, and it's more of the primer, if you will, for the baby with all of the essential immunological compounds. So we're getting that initial influence of secretory IgA, which is the immunoglobulin that lines our mucosal membranes, so intestines, respiratory tract, skin. This is where I was mentioning that within these immunoglobulins, baby is less susceptible to allergies and inflammatory processes. Uh, This IgA really provides the first line of defense that will lay out their immunological response for years to come. So this is a really important component there. And then we see that the composition is predominantly immunologic and really not nutritional in in our colostrum. And so we're going to get also lactoferrin and we're going to get some growth factor in there. We're going to get more electrolyte influence um, and we will see that as the more mature milk comes in, the composition there is more three to 5% fat, um, just under 1% of protein, and then uh, around 7% of carbohydrate, which is coming from lactose, and then like 0.2% mineral constituents, and then the remainder made up of water, fluid, right? Um, And so we do see that the protein content is going to be higher and the carbohydrate content is going to be lower in the colostrum than in the mature milk. But mama's diet does have some level of influence on that mature milk composition itself. And that's where we always joke that fat-fueled mamas have babies that sleep through the night (laughs) because that fat is so satiating and I I really feel um, does impact on a qualitative level. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Noah started sleeping through the night at eight weeks, which when I tell people that, they like don't believe me. <laughs> and Stella did for sure. Yeah. It, yeah. It, absolutely by then for sure. And um, so it can take a range of transition into that, you know, mature um, mama's milk, um, somewhere between four to six weeks postpartum, the human milk is considered fully mature. Um, And somewhere between five to two weeks postpartum, it makes a dynamic change. Typically in those first couple of days or within that first week, um, we'll see a dynamic shift. But again, there's recalibrations even within your quote unquote mature milk based on your diet composition, your stress levels, your calorie deficiency, and so much more. And then even baby's needs and exposures, there's this whole really cool relationship, right, of baby suckling and baby saliva literally communicating with your nipple, which I'm sure we'll get into in a little bit, a little deeper, but it's so, so cool. So yeah, magical. Most definitely. Um, I want to first just cover maybe a little bit deeper on the immune benefits. Um, So what exactly are HMOs and and let's talk probiotic strains that are present as well? Yeah. So again, they're human milk oligosaccharides and they're basically uh, different ranges of sugar structures or carbohydrates that will, you know, differ from any other mammal, hence them being called human (laughs) milk oligosaccharides. And they provide, like I said, that fertilization or prebiotic function to the good gut flora. So the body becomes inoculated through the vaginal canal, through the birth process. And as I shared with Stella, with the emergency C-section, we did vaginal inoculation or seeding where I had a non-sterile gauze inserted in um, my vaginal canal and then that was wiped on her eyes and her mouth um, and her uh, up her nose and her ears basically all of that orifice that would otherwise have been influenced through the birth process and then we're looking at maintaining the active viability of the probacteria that we're getting in the breastfeeding process and so we see the lactobacillus casei we see the raminous cultures and the bifidobacterium and um, these are the ones that, that we know are present in breast milk, but there's also going to be that unique um, diversity, again, associated also with the microbiome of the mama. And this is why we're really big proponents in our, um, what is it called, our, our bundle, mama-to-be bundle, to include a quality probiotic, both to support mom's vaginal health balance and also to support 
her microbiome and to ensure, you know, the mood and immune stability throughout the pregnancy process, but also to maintain good, healthy symbiosis throughout the breastfeeding experience. Totally. And then um, I know with Stella, you did the Ultraflora Baby, I think it was called at the time. They've changed it to like Meta Kids. Kids. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've been using that with Noah since like day three, probably once I felt comfortable like actually administering and (laughs) giving it to him. Um, You know, it's like a a little shaker dropper that you can't really measure how much you're getting. But I've been doing that with him ongoing beyond my own probiotic support. Yeah. Well, you do drops. It's it's measured-ish. You know, so you drop to your fingertip or to your nipple and then baby just kind of suckles on that. I was talking to another new mom who had a three month old and she had the, um, DHA liquid from Nordic naturals, um, which is I think called like baby extra DHA or something like that. And, um, we were talking about vitamin D supplementation, which I do believe vitamin D supplementation and probiotic are great things to bring in right at infancy, you know, so great options right off the bat. And our vitamin D balance blend does have dosage right away from infancy. And so you adjust the dosage based on birth, based on birth weight and then throughout the development process of dosage. Uh, but the DHA baby from Nordic Naturals, you know, it's like an entire ML. And I was like, eh, it's a lot you really of can't. Yeah. yeah. And it, it really doesn't provide it, the, the back of the bottle. It's confusing for consumers. It's five MLs to provide something like 40 IUs of vitamin D. So I was like, no, no, no. Like you're not even getting a full ML into baby. So you're not getting any substantial vitamin D. Um, and even of that, let's look at actually with the just one ML or less, cause you can't give baby that much liquid. <laughs> you know, yeah, <laughs> at no that way. early time stamp. Uh-uh. Even at the three months, I was like, I usually wait on the DHA supplementation until baby's six months or above, but I would say right away complimentary with breastfeeding, vitamin D supplementation and the uh, baby probiotic are appropriate options. Yep. Noah's been doing his vitamin D and he really likes it. Um, like he gets kind of into the, I guess the taste of it now. <laughs> um, but we do that just as a ritual. Um, pretty much every other day he ends up getting it. So it um, I believe we have on the bottle 0.25 ml every three to four days. So it's about right there. Um, so we do that every other day and then the probiotic as a daily. And yeah, we have not started any DHA yet. I think I have that same one. And I was like, this is way too much volume, <laughs> volume, especially in those early days when baby's not really taking in that much volume. That would make me really, really nervous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, and then beyond the immune constituents, um, there are other unique properties of of breast milk that formula just cannot mimic. Um, Let's just use maybe on the endocannabinoid connection because this is so, so cool. Yeah, you know, so formula, I think every decade or maybe every three to four years tries to get on top of the science. So now there are formulas that you'll find with prebiotic fibers in them. Um, often though, they're going to use things like inulin or chicory root. So more things that we would find in like the processed food industry, they obviously can't put those human milk oligosaccharides <laughs> in the formula, but they're also now adding Uh, probiotics and things like that. Not all formula, but you will find some on the market. There is yet though (laughs) to be a formula that has CBD in it. Nope, not yet. (laughs) And I'm not sure. I I honestly, mark my words, it could absolutely be coming to market soon, Um, especially as CBD has become less and less controversial, you know, over the last five years that it's been more mainstream and uh, throughout the country versus just an area where cannabis is legal. So, you know, uh, endocannabinoids, uh, we have a lot of uh, content. Well, um, not a decent amount. We'll probably do for a whole other episode, Becky, on the endocannabinoid system. Um, we do have one that we had uh, Stephen Chernisky on, and we'll definitely link that all about CBD. And that was way back as well. But it's just important to recognize that the cell membranes in our body are naturally equipped with cannabinoid receptors. And so we have an endocannabinoid system, meaning within the body uh, system that responds to these types of compounds, which we can also make endocannabinoids, or we produce cannabinoid-based compounds within our own body as well. And they are seen in breast milk, and we do see that they can provide a significant impact on immune 
inflammatory regulation, as well as even aiding in appetite stimulation and supporting the suckling process. So we can trend things like failure to thrive in, in an element of connection of breastfed babies and in part could be connected to the CB1 receptors. Um, there's actually CB1 receptors that are critical for milk suckling and they get activated through the stimulus of actually getting some of these endocannabinoids passed through the maternal milk. So, so cool. Um, and I know CBD was the supplement I was on throughout pregnancy. I felt really comfortable taking and definitely like raging at those first few days postpartum. So I'm sure Noah got a little extra, extra CBD. Well, and that's why we always answer that in that way when people say, well, is CBD safe, um, you know, for breastfeeding? I say, well, your body makes cannabidiol. So I would yep. say yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's maybe transition and I'll, I'll share um, just on my breastfeeding journey if you want to start asking me some questions um, for a change. Sure. Let's do it. So um, let's talk about from your birth process. We, we all got that yep. <laughs> and all of yep. the sounds and all that in between. Um, so you did do immediate skin to skin and you were like transferred to a bed, I think very quickly mm-hmm. um, after delivery. And uh, tell me, like, did you guys do the chest crawl or what was the, the process for initial breastfeeding? Yeah, it felt, it feels like really blurry now, um, but he was on my belly and kind of did that crawl um, at my chest and it was amazing how strong his legs were even like in that you know first couple minutes after birth that he could kind of get himself up there um, and I do think I had some help actually latching him so he didn't latch like immediately but definitely within that that first hour um, and that golden hour I just want to talk about that maybe for just a minute um, it's super super critical I've to, never heard the phrase yeah um, so it's that first hour after birth. And some people say actually three hours would be like the gold standard ideal, but super critical to baby's development and that initial onset of your breastfeeding relationship. Um, so this is, you know, within the first hour, ideally you're not removing baby from mama. You're doing the delayed cord clamping that we've talked about immediate skin to skin in that first hour and then any newborn assessments or any you know interventions are either delayed which was the case for me they didn't do anything for like the first three hours other than um, check his temperature and and check him with the stethoscope check his breathing and his lungs make sure they were clearing out Um, really delaying all of those non-urgent tasks and then that early initiation of breastfeeding and the benefits are that you know baby leads initiation of breastfeeding. Um, We can see temperature and breathing regulation for baby, um, reduced hypoglycemia, so helping to regulate blood sugar. This is going to help to promote that delayed cord clamping, um, promotes attachment and bonding between mama and baby, improves your breastfeeding success rates, and we've seen it to also boost immunity. Wow, yeah, I think that's really powerful and um, a lot of similar research, just different name, is of why we think the importance of that skin to skin contact yep. and that immediate touch. It's it's funny because um, I remember like the first because Stella came out in such a traumatic way. Um, there was like a lot of epinephrine surging through me, and I was on a morphine IV, and I couldn't feel my body, and. Um, you know, I thought I was going to die, actually. <laughs> like, I was like, oh, my gosh, something's mm-hmm. bad because everyone had the big eyes. And my uh, high-risk uh, surgeon said, oh, you know, of the thousands of C-sections, this is one of the top memorables because he had to actually scoop her out of my uterus and had his entire form in me. Um, and so when she came out, I, I, like, first was like, she's not crying, she's not crying, like the movies because I didn't know what mm-hmm. to expect or whatever. And um, then I heard her, and I was like, oh, like I had a huge release there. And she did immediately go on me and they were like swabbing her. My midwife was trying to swab her with all the vaginal inoculation while she was on me. And um, I felt like the most intense like chemical surge of like 
get this baby off of me. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I was just totally overburdened with everything. Mm-hmm. And I thought I was, I thought that I couldn't, I, I couldn't handle it. Like I was just like, okay, okay. Um, I can't feel my arm. I might be having a heart attack or dying. I don't think this baby should be on mm-hmm. me right now. And it needed like, I think 15 minutes for them to take me out of the surgical suite. And Brady held her skin to skin and she was pretty calm and chill. And then when I was in like the post-op section, but it was within like 15 minutes, um, she was on my chest again and she immediately started feeding. Like she was a big girl who was hungry <laughs> and knew all the things to do. And then it was like all good, yeah. um, all the rest of it. Yeah. But yeah. She's, she's a girl who knows what she wants um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. still to this day. Uh, yeah. But even that, you know, 15 minutes of of time on Brady's chest I'm sure I don't know off the top of my head the benefits but Byron like ripped his shirt off right away too he's like when can I do it I'm like oh no like Mm -hmm. you don't get to (laughs) that was like if I'm incapacitated you get to be you know (laughs) right the one to do skin to skin but yeah I'm sure still very 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 beneficial especially for the temperature regulation and heart rate regulation yeah well we always joke it's like because you were at a space like after the cliff like over Mm -hmm. the hill and like so was Noah like exhausted from the journey and like Stella and I were like what the frick what just happened oh my gosh oh my gosh (laughs) so like a totally different energy totally like we were like on the peak of the the whatever in like the delivery timestamp so totally different energy and excitatory response I would say yeah (laughs) <laughs> um, so yeah, no, it definitely needed a little bit more help, like latching at first. And I felt so clueless. Like I had watched videos and I had, you know, taken as like part of my, um, birthing course, there was a module on breastfeeding. Um, but I wasn't like, you know, practicing, um, prior to him coming other than, you know, my, uh, initial time with the pump, um, during labor, I wasn't really like practicing positioning or anything and I felt so clueless um when the nurse nurses and midwives were like oh do you want help with that I'm like yes I have actually no idea what I'm doing so they were kind of showing me the I think they called it like the sandwich hold where you take your breast and kind of compress it you know giving it a shape that's going to more easily fit into baby's mouth um, and I remember them telling me like tickle his nose first so he opens his mouth and then you kind of pop your nipple toward his bottom lip um, but it for something that you know should be so quote-unquote natural it felt very unnatural and very much like I have no idea what the heck I'm doing at first yeah I remember the the big impact for us was like the the cheek stroke for sure mm-hmm. to like I always thought of Stella as a little guppy yeah <laughs> and um it was like to get that fish bite on deep enough of a latch was always the key because I remember in the hospital after I had the morphine pulled out right away and as I could start to then feel my body um well, that's also probably what helped me, Becky, in the beginning because she was just feeding and I couldn't feel it. So yep. I was like, this is fine. <laughs> you know, like she's probably tearing up my nipple. I was like, this is good. Um, and again, that was like our downstream of like all the, the energy and the oxytocin helping to rescue me and all the things. Um, so I remember like within 24 hours that second day after we spent the first night in the hospital, I had everything off of me, IV wise and such. And um, it was like that shallow, that shallow, um, intense guppy suck where she wasn't getting enough output and um she was really distressing my nipples so we would do the cheek thing and then I would position so that yeah I would try to get her past the entire colored part of my nipple mm-hmm. versus just that front part yep. um, you probably know more of the terms because I didn't watch a dang video <laughs> or any of it I mean honestly it didn't help what helped was like time and having experts who could tell me um <laughs> if I was kind of sort of doing it right and then like you know we were watching YouTube videos because those first few days really I didn't notice any influence of, of pain. Like everyone said from the exterior that things looked great. So the nurse was like, oh, looks like a great latch because you need that whole areola, you know, in baby's mouth. And from the outside, all of that was happening. It looked like he was, you know, sucking well, although he was like super sleepy. But I think that's really normal, especially for um, babies that are born vaginally. And again, they need that time to like rest and recoup. Um, But everyone kept telling us it looks great from the outside. And then by like day three, I remember having a moment of um, being in the bathroom and literally like, 
losing it and crying because my milk had just come in. So my boobs were like super hard and engorged. And, um, you know, I was like spraying milk all over the place and Noah's crying and my nipples were really torn up, like bleeding, cracking, and in so, so much pain all of a sudden by day three. Um, and I was not expecting that. <laughs> yeah, I think that was the same same for me as far as timeline-ish. And the other funny like guppy part was like that the one thing that the lactation specialist in the hospital showed me was like the fish hook mm-hmm. exit. Because it was both the like on and off part yep. that I would like look at Brady and be like, okay, okay, okay. And like, right, tr- try to turn and hope she got a good latch that I didn't have to take her off and mm-hmm. relatch. And then it was the, the dismount part, that little fish hook, I think was a, a big thing that we were able to do that was helpful for us. Yeah, I remember being so afraid that my finger was like going to hurt him. And they're like, no, he is fine. Like, cut your nail short. He's good. Um, and it was really <laughs> intense getting him both on and off. And then we had some moments where Byron would like watch a video and try to quote unquote help me. Um, and just you know, based on like the hormone cascades and everything else going on. Um, that was, that was probably a bad idea on his part. He's like, okay, I'm going to bring Noah over. You get your nipple ready and then I'll pop him on. I'm like, your body doesn't have the same pain perception Mm -hmm. that I'm experiencing Mm -hmm. (laughs) right now. Um, but that was where a lactation consultant really, really came in handy. Um, and I know you had one at the hospital, correct? Yeah. Just, yeah. I mean, Standard, five like minutes. Literally, she yeah. just showed me yeah. the hook part. Yeah. And I was like, that's helpful yeah. because yep. I was yanking her right. off of her. Right, myself, right. Which was terrible oh, because, yeah. like a guppy, as I would pull her off of, again, because she was ferocious right out of my body. <laughs> and so I would like pull her off me and she would go, yeah. like try to get tighter and uh-huh. deeper. <laughs> so all that hook <laughs> thing was huge for me. And um, yeah, my, my setback, I mean, she was. She had so much energy that she took in a lot of milk. She was great. They were worried about macrosomium because she was a big baby. Mm-hmm. Um, so they were testing some blood sugar levels. And at one point in the hospital, they were like, oh, maybe, you know, we might want to consider formula feed. And I was like, give me my baby. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's like, I got this, you know, because I think I had maybe waited like over an hour and mm-hmm. something and because I was trying to let my nipples rest. Um, and for me, the, the most helpful thing was hot showers coconut oil and I did the cabbage cup thing like I would take uh, sliced cabbage and put it in my bra and just being topless everywhere mm-hmm. just oxygenation yeah yep. was like everything I needed yeah um yep I did the cabbage cups early on really helped with like that initial engorgement um but yeah a lactation consultant would be something that I'd recommend to any mama and if you do have a hospital birth that is available you know for you to basically ask for a consult um, I don't know how frequently you're allowed to do it in those first early days and I'm sure it's like max of 15 minutes if you even get that um, so we ended up having someone come to the house at like day maybe day five to seven because it was so painful and I'm like I I can't do this like I understood and had so many moments where I was like I understand why people stop um, it would be so easy to give him a bottle. It would be so easy to like pump and give him a bottle. I was running through like, you know, on Amazon, like buying nipple shields, which I never even took out of the box, but it's amazing at 3 a.m. when you're in that much pain. Um, like at that point it was more painful than, um, any of my like residual, you know, stitches and, and tear and all of that, that part hurt the most. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. It is intense. You need a community. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so the lactation consultant did, um, you know, did some positioning stuff and um, ended up um, showing us that Noah had a little bit of a tongue tie and a lip tie. So we went down this whole rabbit hole and I'll spare you guys all the um, details for sake of time. But we went down this whole rabbit hole of tongue tie diagnosis and ended up taking him to a pediatric dentist because I was like, this has to be it. You know, I can hold out for um, you know, the two weeks that it takes to get him in and, you know, have this little laser procedure and everything's going to be better. Um, and so it was this big build up to like, okay, we're going to take him and they're going to fix this because it was still super painful, like two, three weeks in. Um, and the pediatric dentist ended up saying that his tongue tie was too minor <laughs> to release. Um, so 
it was a little bit of a, a letdown and we ended up having the lactation consultant come back and do some actual like exercises um, with Noah. I'll link, I like did all of the, <laughs> all of the research, um, but I'll link some of the main like um, pediatric dentists who are big specialists on tongue and lip tie and some of the exercises that we did. Um, and we also did craniosacral therapy and chiropractic work. It was like, this is the most... <laughs> bougie little Austin baby who's getting like all of the <laughs> specialties. But it's just one of those things where, you know, people say that breastfeeding shouldn't hurt. And my experience was very much the opposite. Oh, I that. feel like those people are liars and I, you shouldn't yeah. be allowed to share yeah. misinformation yeah. because breastfeeding is absolutely painful and it, it takes everyone their own timeline. I think for me, I was like suffering hard from days two until like three and a half, maybe four weeks um, and with little ebbs and flows in between. Mm -hmm. And um, I had my biggest setback at week eight. I went back to work full time at like seven weeks. And so of course, stress played a role in that. And I uh, took Stella to this like Montessori music class that could start at week eight. She blew out on my skirt. <laughs> it was embarrassing and fine, whatever. But I remember bringing her back. So not only did I feel like an overburdened mom who was at angst because she was working, you know, outside of the home, away from her new baby, and then took her to this class and her baby pooped on her lap and she didn't even know what she was doing. And then that evening, I must have had just like such a surge of stress. Stella like went on hiatus and she like protested eating breast milk. And um, we had just brought in bottles because I was back to work and she would take a bottle but wouldn't breastfeed. And so I, I like had a standoff conversation with Brady where I was like, nope, we're not giving her a bottle. Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, dude, like she needs to eat. And I was like, I'm right here. I'm mom. Like I had like a really primal like, no, we're going to figure this out. And we ended up taking like a hot bath together. And I just laid literally with just underwear and like, you know, just topless for six to eight hours and she finally did the crawl. That's like the only time mm -hmm. that she did the chest crawl on her own time. And like primally was like, okay, I'm going to take <laughs> the milk from mom. <laughs> and then like from there we got in a groove again. But I feel like that was her and I like, I mean, we'll revisit this every five years, probably mother daughter relationship oh, yeah, drama, sure. <laughs> but of like her asserting her like, fine, mom, you left me. I don't need you. <laughs> um, and then me being like, what? Um, and so it was, that was my most like traumatic but it was all within 24 hours and, oh my and then she was back on it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so yeah, there was a lot of like crowdsourcing in those early days, asking other moms, um, a lot of late night Amazon. <laughs> yeah. Talk purchases. about your silverette. I know. Cause those weren't a thing in my day. I mean, I don't know if I would have uh, done it, but yeah. Tell me about. So these. this was like a one-off, like sleep deprived, I don't know, day five purchase where I had a friend who had a baby maybe 10 days before me and we were connecting and texting about how painful breastfeeding was. And she's like, they're expensive, but you need to get silverettes. And I'm like, I've never heard of them. I don't know what they are. Um, so I Google it and I literally just bought them without even like, I don't even look at what they are. So um, they are these little silver, so made of, of actual silver metal um, cups that go over your nipples. And I think they're made in Italy. They're very popular in Europe and especially France. Um, and what they're supposed to do is, um, one, protect and shield your nipple from damage from your bra. So besides being topless, if you do end up having to like leave the house and put on a bra, especially if your nipples are really raw. Yeah, that chafing. Ha yeah, having some kind of a, a barrier is very helpful. Um, but two, the other thing that they do, and I, I firmly believe this, so we know we talk about like colloidal silver being antimicrobial. Well, silver is antimicrobial, so it can help to not only heal that tissue, um, but it can also help to prevent infection and thrush and even things like mastitis. And that could be why I never experienced any um, mastitis, but I literally felt like I'd put them on, I'd put a bra on, 
and you you um, express a little bit of breast milk. So you don't use them with any like creams or coconut oil or anything. You express a teeny bit of breast milk, which in and of itself can actually be very healing yeah. for that chapped skin. Um, and then you leave them on in between feedings. And I swear like that turned such a corner um, just on the like cracking, bleeding, chafing. Like anytime I put them on, the next time I took them off, it was like new skin had formed and really, really helped with that healing process. Um, so I'll link those in our show notes. They are pricey, um, but they were something that you can actually, you can use them throughout. Um, like if, you know, God forbid when Noah gets teeth, if he like bites me and I have a wound, um, and you can use them for another Multiple baby babies, in the yeah. future. Yeah. Um, so those were like a huge, just random purchase that actually I've recommended to clients and they've had the same experience where it's very, very helpful and prevents infection, um, and really helps with healing. And then you had told me about these ice packs as well Mm -hmm. that I found really, really helpful in those first initial like three weeks or so just to like numb Mm -hmm. (laughs) your nipple uh, before putting baby on. So I would do that. I found that like at night before his um, bedtime feeding, I think because he was doing a lot of like cluster feeding, that tended to be my most painful time. Um, and then, um, that like 2 AM to 6 AM timestamp also, that's when you're producing the most milk. Um, so that was another time that I was feeling like really engorged and hot and painful. And I never did hot compresses. I always wanted like the cold ice pack. Yeah. I, I loved a hot shower, Mm -hmm. um, anytime, especially if I ever felt, I didn't have any mastitis and I didn't really get any clogged ducts, but I could sometimes feel like that the tightness or you know um what felt maybe backed up in my lymph if you will so like breast massage in the shower was huge i know and then i would literally like the big feed i would always wait to take a hot shower like towards the tail end of her nap because i would come out of the shower just like dripping (laughs) breast milk and i was ready to put her on then um and uh, yeah the only things we did were top the topical coconut oil and then the um the cabbage leaves, which I really only maybe did six times Mm -hmm. in total. Um, And that was a big thing. I think the big thing that I've seen with engorgement is, yes, if baby doesn't have a deep enough latch or if you're Mm overpumping, like if you're filling your fridge and not filling your child, then you are creating more of a demand than there is necessarily an output. And, you know, I'm a really big proponent of really only pumping to replace a missed feed. Um, so, you know, if, if baby is feeding five times on your chest and one bottle, you pump one time Mm -hmm. and you kind of keep that cycle because you want that symbiotic, again, connection of the timestamp of the milk that you're giving baby to be within that given ideally week of production, because there's all different compounds that synergistically your body makes in response to baby saliva and needs. Um, these could be, again, immunological growth development, biological in the world of the microbiome. So when we're talking about right now, like cold, flu, um, and even allergy, right? So there's virus going on right now, and there's also a lot of cedar fever going on right now. Yeah, so, you can probably hear it in my voice, guys. <laughs> so, you know, the breast yep. milk Becky's putting out right now is helping Noah to understand juniper and cedar fever. Mm-hmm. So it, I just think that there's such a timeliness to that and, and that that's a really important kind of take home for new mamas and that prevents a lot of the complications off the bat. Yep. Yep. And I think I went through like one whole head of cabbage, but the engorgement too, it's part of that like first few weeks calibration of your body learning baby's demand and, and your supply kind of calibrating with that so usually it only lasts that first six weeks or at least for me did um and now I only have that if we like you know he sleeps 12 hours or something you right. wake up Byron's like why are the sheets wet again I'm like what do you think I'm like <laughs> spraying milk over here <laughs> oh my gosh okay delightful so before we go on uh we're going to cover some food as medicine support and ways to ensure that you can make the most nutrient-dense super milk um, but let's first take a word from our sponsor of today's episode Nutrisense. So you guys heard Allie talk on our episode all about her continuous glucose monitor experiment about NutriSense. So this is a CGM that provides you with real-time glucose data. Each sensor lasts 14 days or two weeks, and it comes with an easy-to-use iPhone app or phone app um, that helps you combine and visualize your glucose data with all of your daily activities. So you input things like your sleep, your stress, 
your exercise, your food, and then they actually have a registered dietitian on staff who can provide you with personalized recommendations based on your data. Yeah, so I'm a huge proponent of NutriSense after personally using it and making a lot of aha connections. Uh, It's episode 209, I believe, of the Naturally Nourished podcast, so you can check that out. One of my biggest ones was, yes, I am fat adapted and I do have good metabolic flexibility, which I would have expected. And I even pushed the parameters, if you will, of of really how much carb I could take in and still stay well under, um, you know, a optimal blood sugar control. But stress had so much more of a dynamic impact on my blood sugar than I would have anticipated. In fact, my highest three data points came after stressful episodes. And I even had half of a chocolate milkshake and sweet potato fries one of the time. So (laughs) that says a lot about stress. So I just really find that using a CGM and working with NutriSense can completely take the guesswork out from the equation. So you really get personalized responses to food, stress, exercise, and sleep instead of a generic recommendation or cherry picking your data. You know, some of you may have used a, um, you know, glucose strip or a ketone meter, but at that point, you're really selecting what you're testing. You're maybe not getting that same day of your fasted blood sugar as well as, again, postprandial after meal and after a stressful episode. So you can purchase a CGM by visiting NutriSense.io, and their website has several different options depending on the time commitment, whether you want to do that two-week intro or a couple-month plan, and use the code ALLIRD, so that's just A-L-I-R-D, and this will give you $30 off a monthly subscription plan um, and also let them know that you heard about them from the Naturally Nourished podcast. So again, it's NutriSense.io. It's the best way that you can really get a thorough understanding of how diet and lifestyle impacts your blood sugar and your metabolism. Awesome. All right. So let's maybe talk a little bit about um, milk production and, and supply issues. So we hit on kind of the oversupply Um, especially with pumping, but um, this became a a big concern, milk supply in terms of undersupply. Um, For me, at about 10 weeks, my brother passed away unexpectedly, and this stress, I I was really scared that I was going to have to stop breastfeeding or wouldn't be able to produce for Noah. Like Byron was like, I'll go get formula, and that just made everything that was going on <laughs> like 10 times worse. Um, but I could tell even in that first 24 hours that my milk production had dropped dramatically and Noah was definitely making those like hunger cries and wanting to eat more often. Yeah. And I, I'm sure both the, I know that when I looked at Byron, when that went down, I was like, you need to keep Becky calm, <laughs> give her long, deep hugs, and feed her face. <laughs> it's yeah. like, these are the three things yeah. that I want you to do to support my dear friend. Um, and, and he was like, okay, okay. But I was like, I, I got, I was like right away, like, oh man, this is going to be a trifecta. And I think that those are the big things, you know, when the body is surging cortisol hormone or, or having more of a fight or flight response, that can throw off blood sugar metabolism and that can throw off milk uh, production. We can also see when the body goes into more of that neurochemical fight or flight response again, if the body doesn't feel safe, um, just like with infertility and hormone imbalance, it's not going to be in an optimized state to produce for another being. The body's just like, whoa, I can hardly handle me right now. I don't know what's happening and if I should even be producing something for this other being right now. Um, So there's a lot of complex mechanisms and I think that stress, I mean, that was a really dynamic hit for you, Becky, but stress in any level, even the return to work, which I think about in that right timestamp of like that 10 to 14 week window. And that's also when babe growth development is going through some dynamic leaps where intake and you know what you went from, I don't know, do you remember when you transitioned from four ounce bottles to six or was that around that time? I think probably right around that time. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. Right. So the demands really change, I think, as well. Yeah. Um, And plus, you know, if you're someone who doesn't eat under stress, I think that has a big dynamic influence. Like I dropped 10 pounds in a week and a half and then, you know, slowly was able to to regain that. And I knew... (laughs) I knew it was you that put Byron up to like the long hugs because it's just not something he naturally <laughs> he's like awkward does. So he's like, come here, and then I can see like he's counting in his head to twenty. <laughs> but he was he was great. He was 
fantastic with that. And then I had another friend come over like before we ended up flying up to Connecticut and bring me a huge bag of snacks, including like some of the Earth Mama, um, I think it's called lactation support tea. Um, I also had all of the ingredients for lactation (laughs) cookies shipped up to Connecticut right away. Um, You were so kind to send me a case of fond bone broth and then you coordinated with my friends to send some favorite snacks. So maybe let's talk about yes some of our, our favorites and go-tos. Um, let's get back to those peanut butter cups. Yes, Did I you pulled pull them the, up. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. I need to share. Uh-huh. So it's not Perfect Foods. It's Perfect Snacks is the name of the company. And you may be familiar with them because they have their refrigerated bars in Costco. And they have come out with a new product called Dark Chocolate with Sea Salt. Uh, and they're called Peanut Butter Cups. And the ingredient profile, I just have to read to you because... I'm constantly dancing with my husband about, you know, what quote unquote treats Stella can have. Mm -hmm. And he recently got this trail mix from Whole Foods and it's like the 365 brand and it has these stupid little peanut butter cups in them with, you know, soy lecithin and uh, there's industrialized like cottonseed oil on the nuts. And I'm just like, this is trash. (laughs) So yeah, it's a constant dance. And then I'll take like the, the Hue Kitchen gems and cut those in half with some organic dry roasted or raw almonds and some torn mango organic. And that's her trail mix, you know, so we're constantly navigating. I'm like, it looks the same. I get it. It looks like (laughs) nuts and chocolate chunks, but this is a very different food. And and these are the reasons why I think he needs to listen to that episode where we ranted on industrialized oils. (laughs) But anyway, so these are super clean and I was stoked to see that. So peanut butter is the first ingredient and then they have a dark chocolate chocolate coating, which is very clean. Um, then they have honey, non-fat dry milk, rice protein, dried whole egg powder, sea salt, dried whole food powders, which include kale, flaxseed, rosehip, orange, lemon, papaya, tomato, apple, alfalfa, celery, kelp, dulse, carrot, and spinach. There is sunflower lecithin, but not soy, uh, flaxseed oil, uh, sunflower oil, sesame oil, olive oil, and pumpkin seed oil. So you are getting a good blend of fats in there. The profile is really fantastic on your macros. So you can have two of these chocolate coated peanut butter cups. It's 210 calories, 16 grams of carbs. So only eight grams of carb per cup, but you're still getting seven grams of protein and then 14 grams of fat. So it's definitely not a naked carb. It has that nice balance of you know, getting close to that half of the amount of protein of the carb and a good balance distributed of fat. And it's really an indulgence. I mean, Stella was pumped. She was likening it to a Justin's peanut butter cup, but totally cleaner and more nutrient dense profile here. And then their bars can be even better. Yep. Um, and yeah, the bars were something I used a lot, um, like early on and still do. I'll throw one in my bag if I'm like running out. I have one in my bag today for our podcast recording day. Um, but anytime you can have like a treat, especially for Stella, that comes out of a package that's really clean, um, I think is a, a huge win. So I'm glad to discover those. Um, like I said, the lactation cookies recipe. Um, I'll from link the blog. that mm-hmm. from the, the oats, blog. Yep, because that's uh, featured. Mm-hmm. It's got oats, brewer's yeast, and um, flaxseed in it, which are all considered to be galactagogues that aid in milk support. Um, And actually sunflower lecithin um, that you mentioned, um, a lot of people will use soy lecithin, um, but sunflower should be about equivalent for prevention of of mastitis. So that could actually have... phospholipid element. Mm -hmm. Um, That could actually have beneficial impact, I'm sure. It's just a, a very minute amount in the perfect foods. Um, fond bone broth was, was huge and, um, harmless harvest coconut water. So I think hydration is always a really big Mm -hmm. element, um, with milk production, right? You need water to make milk. Um, Right. What percent of that was? I mean, it was a lot. It's it's a really dynamic percentage. (laughs) Almost 90, I think. Yep. Um, and I notice if I'm dehydrated and pumping and then I like take a break, drink a coconut water or bone broth real quick, I'll be able to pump like dynamically, you know, from two ounces to like six ounces of volume in a pretty short, um, time stamp. And then other foods that are supportive, like I said, oats, leafy greens, um, fennel actually can be very supportive. So I used some like fennel, um, tea, um, the, I think it's mother love tea. Um, I also ended up buying just cause I was like in a total 
panic mode of like, I need to make milk and um, support everyone else and myself right now. Um, so I ended up buying the Mother Love, um, I think it's called like More Milk Moringa. Um, so Moringa leaf actually can be very helpful in milk production. Um, and then it has some other herbal constituents in there, some nettle leaf and fennel, um, as well as that sunflower lecithin. Um, and then on a supplemental level as well, relax and regulate. I felt like really, really helped me during this timestamp too. Yeah, both in aiding that myo-inositol in overall cellular communication, but one of the mechanisms there is insulin resistance can uh, interfere with milk supply. So having that insulin sensitivity can help with milk synthesis. And I think that that's a really important one to note again during this transitional period. I think, and unfortunately, what's really unique to you, Becky, is your stress a, the timeline you were getting geared up to go back to work as well. And then there's also like the loss and depression heaviness because that's going to hinder appetite in a different way probably than just a general stress, like a you stress, you sure. know, going back to work, whatnot. So I think in all sense, we want to look at foods though that we look forward to eating. Uh-huh. <laughs> and that's important if you do have lack of appetite that comes up with stress. And I know that for me, one of my favorite things that worked really well to get the fluid in and the nutrient density and a lot of those featured foods um, were versions of like my Tropical Bliss smoothie, um, which I still do versions of that today. Uh, It's such a great vehicle to get in two cups of leafy greens, full fat coconut milk, you know, ginger in there, the naturally nourished grass fed whey to get more immunoglobulins for me, but also get that protein in. And it's just so easy. You could throw in almond butter or other things to help to, you know, mix up flavor profile. I'll use frozen mango often. And um, I think just so great because you can sip it passively versus slowing down. And (laughs) this is the timestamp where especially if mama has another kid that's toddling around the house Mm -hmm. or whatnot, we're just not prioritizing self-care and getting that calorie density in, in bars, cookies, baked goods, and smoothies is a really good consideration. Yep. I've been doing like a morning smoothie, especially clinic days. Like when I go in right at 9 a.m., I'll have a smoothie and then Byron will make my eggs like 11 to 12 or so. So that's more of a a lunch. Um, Let's maybe wrap up on um, just a couple supplement recommendations, I think, just to round out today's episode because it's getting... (laughs) It's getting to that hour mark already. Yes, so much, so much more to say. Um, but maybe um, just a couple notes on um, supplements to kind of enhance healthy milk, make super milk. Um, I know I've obviously been on our prenatal um, for quite some time since we came out with it. Um, but our mama to be bundle would be like my biggest recommendation for really any, you know, anyone who's trying to conceive, anyone who's currently pregnant. And then definitely during that breastfeeding, um, timestamp doing the EPA DHA extra, the, um, multivalent mama prenatal, and then the baseline probiotic or with history of dysbiosis, I ended up doing our rebuild spectrum and targeted strength probiotics for yeah. myself. Yeah. I cheated and did the targeted strength the whole way through. Yeah. Yeah. But we're overachievers exactly. when it comes to supplements. Yeah. I would say on the, the last thing with supplements. So we talked about relax and regulate with actually helping with output and production and both in the sense of supporting that HPA access so the body feels safe as well as the insulin sensitivity. What were some of the formulas, Becky, that you brought back in mm-hmm. postpartum? I don't think we covered that in your postpartum episode. I, I think you did talk about doing inflamazine mm-hmm. and super turmeric, of yep. course, in the recovery. Um, but is it adaptogen boost? Was that one that you were yep. off of during your pregnancy? But I now took doing it and- very occasionally, just because the jury is out on some of those herbs um, for safety during pregnancy. But I still did from time to time. I felt cost benefit, especially third trimester, babies fully cooked. Um, and then I brought that back pretty dynamically now at like two a day, which has been really helpful. Um, And then the adrenal support I was doing during pregnancy, but just not as vigilant and focused on. And now I'm making sure to get at least one of those in the morning, especially with the stress um, influence of, you know, getting back to work and all the things. Um, Osteofactors, I kept that one in from, I think, second, end of second trimester. So I'm still doing that. Um, And I've actually increased that to three now 
because Noah's had some skin stuff, I had to pull back on dairy a little bit. So I really wanted to make sure I'm getting plenty of calcium. Um, vitamin D I've been doing the whole time. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I brought And you did back cellular in. antioxidants cellular the whole way through. Cellular the whole way through. Although, B complex. Um, yep, B complex I've been using ongoing. Um, I haven't really brought back calm and clear um, yet just because I was doing more like CBD and um, feeling like my adrenals were kind of at a more of a flat line. And sometimes when I take calm and clear during those times, um, it makes me a little bit sleepy, but I've been doing it in the evening time, like to help with sleep one or two prior to bed. And that's something I definitely wasn't doing during pregnancy. Right. That one with the valerian and the ashwagandha. Mm -hmm. The ashwagandha is the more controversial one as far as herbs uh, in the adaptogenic world that aren't safe during pregnancy. But yes, Calm and Clear is safe during uh, breastfeeding. And that's one that I definitely used a lot of Mm -hmm. because again, we're wired differently. Right. Right. (laughs) I'm wired more. Go, 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 go. So awesome. Hopefully today's episode provided you uh, at least a nice light laugh and some reflection on maybe your past journey or your to come journey for those mamas and to be mamas. And you learned something additional about breastfeeding and the magic of, you know, nature's perfect food that we make for our babies. If you love today's episode, take a moment and go on over to iTunes or wherever you're listening and leave us a five-star review. It's always really helpful for us to see positive feedback and affirmation that we're putting out info that y'all are loving and have another wonderful week filled with wellness. Thank you for listening to the Naturally Nourished Podcast. Visit our blog at AllieMillerRD.com for recipes, wellness tips, and food as medicine meal plans. Connect with Allie and Becky at AllieMillerRD on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Until next time, stay nourished and be well.